And we look at this for a complex patch. The CPU meter just going, oh my goodness. Hello, I'm Robin Vincent and welcome to Molten Music Technology. Today, we're having another look at the Surface Pro 6. I've already done a couple of videos on it, a bit of an unboxing one, one testing out various bits of software and doors to see what it could run. But what I haven't done yet is really dig down into what is actually possible. The performance, the limits to answer those questions that I get every week about how many plugins can it run? Can I run this piece of software? Can I run this synth? Can I do this recording on it? Can I use it for music? What sort of performance can I expect to get? I get asked that a lot. And so I thought it was time to, to, to really try to find some kind of way to quantify that because it's not as easy as we'd like to think. I mean, I've been running this Surface Pro 6 for about six months now, and it's pretty much eaten up everything that I've asked it to do. It has its limitations, of course, and that's how we treat it. We treat it as a laptop with limitations because it also offers a great deal of creative appeal. I mean, it's gorgeous for one. It has a touchscreen, it has a pen interface, and there's a lot to be said for the aesthetic and the portability and all the loveliness and quality that comes with a Microsoft Surface Pro. But along with that, we have to accept that it's not designed for music production. It's designed for a bit of drawing, a bit of graphic work, a bit of browsing, email, work, spreadsheets, that kind of thing. It's designed to be your computer on the go in a beautiful form factor with a remarkably creative interface. It's not designed for running orchestras, for making your latest EDM hit or churning out chip tunes. It's is not whether we like it or not. Microsoft did not have us sort of people in mind when they put the thing together. But that's okay, no laptop ever is. No computer ever is, unless you get it specially built. And so we are very used to working around Windows, working around bits of hardware, and trying our best not to be slightly jealous of our less hassled Apple Mac friends. But let's start with a couple of notes. First of all, in order to get the best out of your Surface Pro 6, you need to have gone through the tweaking and testing video that I've already done, which is already on the channel. So if you have a Surface Pro 6, you need to do that first. Otherwise, there'll be things I'm talking about here that you won't understand, and you won't be able to replicate the sort of results that I'll be getting here. Because out of the box, the Surface Pro 6 uh, you know, is great. It's fine, it's great, but there are things you need to do in order to maximize the performance you're gonna get and to minimize the trouble and the weirdness and the glitching and that kind of stuff. The second note is to remind you that not everything is the same for everything, by which I mean it will matter what audio interface you use. It will matter what Surface Pro 6 you have, what processor you have, how much RAM you have, and your environment and the software you're running and the plugins. Everything matters when you're trying to run some kind of benchmark and find some way of describing the performance of a system because yeah, I could say it runs 50 plugins and then you try to run 50 plugins of a particularly CPU intensive plugin and it's not gonna be able to do that. I could tell you it could run you know, 96 tracks of audio, but it depends on the sample rate of that audio. It depends on what other things are running. It also depends on the performance of your audio interface because that also matters and they are also different. And the last note is that the processor that's in the Surface Pro 6 is not designed to stay on and crunch audio and MIDI and virtual instruments and plugins. That's not what it's about. It wants to do anything else than stay on all the time at a constant rate. And so throughout this testing, I'm gonna be fiddling around with the processor to try to demonstrate how well it can do things consistently and what happens when it doesn't really do it consistently. Because that's the issue. If you look through my tweaking video, I talk about restricting the processor to around 1.6 gigahertz, because that's what happens when you disable the turbo mode, because turbo mode is great. If you're writing a letter, if you're surfing the internet, you're playing a game and you need that, just that little extra boost. Superb as you're filling in a color in Photoshop. That ah, turbo boost is fantastic. But it's not helpful in music production because 
it suddenly gives you extra space that you fill up with plugins and you fill up with automation, you fill it up with virtual instruments, but then it doesn't stay there because it gets hot or it gets bored or some other mystical reason, it just starts stepping down. And that's the point you get crackles and your project no longer works and probably won't load next time you try to load it. And so getting to grips with what's inside the Surface Pro 6 is helpful. And hopefully this video will do a bit of that. I can tell you exactly what the processor is in my one. And of course, your one may differ because you may have the i7, for instance, or the i3 or some other version. But the version that I have is the Core i5-8250U. Now, U series processors are the really uh, difficult ones for music production because they are designed to save power. That's all they want to do. They want to save power and to save power in order to extend your battery life so that you, know, you can have another 10 minutes on the bus using your Surface, assuming you don't get mugged and somebody runs off with it. And so the processor is constantly looking for ways to shut down, which is not what we need. In order to achieve glitch-free audio, we need the processor to be awake and functioning at the same level all the time. And this is not the sort of processor that's designed to do this. So why on earth are we using the Surface Pro 6, I hear you say? Well, it's just lovely. That's all I can say. It's lovely. I love it. I love the form factor. I love the way it works. I love the touchy penny stuff. It's just a great laptop. And all laptops with U-series processor, that means Ultrabooks, anything basically which looks really nice is going to have the same sort of processor. Don't get fooled by the fact it's an i5 or an i7 because there are very, very different ranges of i5s and i7s. And this particular range is the worst for what it is we're trying to do. However, hopefully, combined with my tweaking video as I've mentioned previously, I can show you what it can do. And maybe you'll find that that's enough because all we actually need to do is what we need to do. We're not expecting it to run an entire orchestra. We're not expecting it to be able to record a 64 piece band with microphones going in everywhere and then run a massive load of massive reverbs and compressors and plugins and bits and pieces. However, we can run some stuff and that's what I'm going to attempt to demonstrate as best I can in this very sort of long and involved and detailed, far too much detailed kind of study into the performance of this Surface Pro 6. So let me tell you what I have here because you need some sort of starting point. This is a Surface Pro 6. It's an i5 with eight gigabytes of RAM. That for me has always been the sweet spot. The i5, eight gigabytes. That's what all of my previous Surface Pros have also been. And do check out my forthcoming video where I'm going to compare Surface Pro 6 to the Surface Pro 2017 and the Surface Pro 4, just because I think that's interesting. And there's quite a large secondhand market for these sorts of devices. And that may help you see the difference between the various models. But anyway, moving on, this version of the Surface Pro 6 is the one without the fan. So all the cooling is done passively, which is brilliant because you don't want fan noise, but it may not be great for us because it, it implies that it will thermally throttle if it gets too hot. Also, if you've got the Surface Book 2 or something like that, it doesn't necessarily correlate. They have different technologies, they have different interfaces and those things again matter. So what this is really telling you about is the Surface Pro 6. If you have the i7 and you want to see what difference that would make, all I can really say is that, well, two things really. First of all, yeah, you'll get a percentage increase in performance power, but you'll also get an increase in heat. So you may get extra processing power to run plugins, but it will also probably throttle, which means clock down quicker because it will get hotter quicker. So is an i7 better than an i5? Probably at a pinch, but not by a massive amount, I would suspect. Because we're talking about usable power, not theoretical power, not what, you know, 3D benchmark it could run or some other form of processing. We want to see how well it processes audio, how well it makes music, how well it handles various plugins and bits and pieces in real time without glitching. That's what we're interested in. Not interested in benchmarks, we're interested in stuff that actually works. I have everything running through a single USB port. 
because that's all it's got, right? Single USB port going to a passive hub. It's not even powered. Usually when I've done these videos in the past, I've used powered hubs, but for this one, I'm just using a passive one. It's got four things on it. I can run uh, you know, a MIDI interface and a keyboard and a dongle. That's about it. When I plug like a USB thumb drive in, it goes, I'm not really sure what this is, but then I have to take something out and then it works. So the USB port will power, you know, three to four things normally, but it will power the things that we need. So running off that passive hub, I have the Native Instruments M32 little keyboard here, perfect, USB powered from the passive hub, no bother, no trouble. The other thing I've got is the Native Instruments Complete Audio 2 here. I've just done a review video on this. I spent a good hour talking about why it's good, how it works, what sort of latency you can get. So do go and check that out because it's a good, solid, decent, low latency audio interface. I am not gonna do all of this using the onboard audio. I've done, again, a video on the onboard audio and that has its merits. But if you wanted to do music properly on a Surface Pro 6, you need to have a USB audio interface. It's essential. It gets you the low latency, it gets you the better performance and you get proper inputs and outputs. And this is all USB powered. You can plug it straight in and work straight with it. And throughout this testing, I'm going to stick around the sort of 128 to 256 buffer size. I might swap around a little bit because sometimes it makes a difference and gives it a little bit more breathing room. But the latency, the latency of playing stuff is all going to be well under 10 milliseconds, very playable, very real time. There's very little to be gained in trying to squeeze it all the way down to 32 samples or some ridiculous one millisecond latency because it will work the processor so hard that you'll hardly be able to run anything. So I use a sub 10 millisecond latency. So if you've got an audio interface and you want to compare, then that's the sort of level that we're looking at. So in this video, I'm going to run a number of tests, real proper light musical tests like. I'll start off with the door bench test, which is kind of become a bit of an industry standard, although it's a little bit old now, but the idea is that you run a bunch of audio tracks and you have a certain compressor that you put over the top and how many of those compressors can you run? And that gives you some idea of what the system's capable of. So I'll do that one and I'll do that in Cubase 10. I'll do a similar test in Studio One, but instead of using the sort of the sine wave tests that they do in DoorBench, I'll use actual recorded musical tracks and put a range of different plugins over them to see whether the Surface Pro 6 can handle a, a large multi-track project. I'll then run my old favorite, the polyphony test in uh, Cubase again, using Hallion. The idea of that is that there's just a whole bunch, track upon track of held notes. So we have an idea of the sort of polyphony the system can do. How many instances of the Hallion plugin can it run and what sort of voice count can you get? And that gives you an idea of the sort of VST instrument performance. And then lastly, we'll put together a project using various virtual instruments and plugins in Ableton Live. We'll just keep going until it craps out to see how far we can get. Can we construct an entire track, a piece of music of a decent size? And at what point does it start going nuts? But before we get stuck into those tests, I just want to run through a few of the instruments I've got on here just to demonstrate how some of them can work and some of them for some reason can't, and how the Surface Pro 6 is a little bit on the edge with some of these plugins. So let's start with Arturia Pigments, which is a nice, big, fat, chunky hybrid of a software synth, which can sometimes give a bit of trouble. As you can hear, glitching already. Oh my goodness, it's already glitching. What a load of old rubbish this must be. Yeah, no, Pigments is quite a chunky synth. I mean, the CPU meter here, which you should be able to see, is very quickly up into the 70s and 80s, and that's the reason why we're getting this glitch. But let's try something else. For instance, I get asked a lot about Serum. So that's no good either. Now, the reason why I'm showing you how 
badly this is working is because I don't want you to be under the impression that it's going to knock everything out of the park. It won't. It's going to crap out with large synths running large amounts of polyphony. You know, single notes. And little accords, not quite so much of a problem. It's when I keep banging a whole load of stuff in there that it doesn't like it so much. Now, I just wanted to interject into my own video because as I've been editing the video together, I realized that I, I, I kind of left you with the impression that software synths like Serum and Pigments can't possibly work. And that's completely wrong. What I was trying to say was that with some of the patches, with some of the presets, some of the big polyphony ones of lots of stuff going on, that's going to cause a crackle. You can do it, if you try hard enough, with most synths. For instance, something like the piano from Arturia, if you put on a lot of sustain, attach a sustain pedal, get a lot of that going on, big reverbs, really open it up, you can push it to the point of crackle, which you'd be able to do on any sort of similar ultrabook, really. But that doesn't mean that those bits of software are unusable. You've just got to use it right. So there's tons of stuff in Serum that you can use. That's not going to crap out. Not going to crap out at all. Similarly with pigments. But if I really lay it on thick, I can push it into crackling. Yeah? Does that, does that sort of balance that out a little bit more? So you can totally use pigments, you can use serum, you can use any sort of VST instrument within the limitations of the system. And if you still hang around to the end of the video, you'll see me using a whole bunch, a dozen synths together, all at once, making tunes and wonderful wonderful music together, all on this little Surface Pro 6. Now at the moment the CPU power is restricted to the around 1.6, 1.7 gigahertz, because that's what we did in the tweaking video. And I can change that, I can turn on the turbo mode and show you that actually it then starts getting a bit better. You do that in your advanced power settings, you skip on down to processor power management, this is at the moment set to 99% on minimum and maximum. And what you want to do is put that up to 100 and apply it. Now if we look back at our little meter here, it's now freed itself up to go to potentially 2.4. Now that's dramatically better. It's still not quite there, but it's a lot, lot better. Yeah, I say that and then it goes really bad. But the problem here, of course, is the lack of consistency. So even though it gives us a nice boost up to 2.4 gigahertz, it doesn't stay there. And it's the flittering about which gives us the problem with the glitching. was perfect, almost perfect, but then it just started to drop a little bit and you get that glitch. And that is why we don't leave turbo mode on. 
because there's no consistency. You can't get a consistent signal. It's much better to run a system slower at 1.6 and know where the limitations are, know how many synths you can run, rather than thinking you can run a whole load and then the project's starting to crap out all over the place. So for now, let's keep it at the 99% 1.6, just so that we can keep consistent and see if we can find some synths that do run within the limitations. I mean, let's use something like Reactor. Reactor's quite a meaty piece of software. This is Super 8, which is a very recent Native Instruments instrument. I'm using plenty of polyphony, I'm using plenty of notes, and it's hanging in there around the 40% mark and having a lovely time with it. See another one, that's completely fine. That's within Reactor, another Reactor instrument. This is Retro Mod 106 from Traction. This is a sample bass instrument. Really nice. Roland instruments in here. And absolutely no bother whatsoever. Some big sounds from Contact. These again are sample based. A piano from Arturia. Completely fine. So what is it I'm trying to get at? I'm just trying to demonstrate that instruments are different. It depends which instruments you're running. You will find instruments that the Surface Pro 6 can't handle. For instance, certain parts of serum. No, it can't really handle. Certain parts of pigments. No, it can't really handle, but it can handle a lot of it. It could handle single notes, dual notes, three note chords maybe, and other bits and pieces surrounded by other instruments. Not a problem. Sample based stuff doesn't seem to be much of a problem either. Uh, something like the piano from Arturia, great, yeah, that works fine. So it will vary from plug-in to plug-in. For instance, this is quite interesting. This is the Marcus uh, 88, which is a spectrally modelled Rose piano. And it glitches, which is a shame because it's a really, really nice little piano. However, the same company does another one based on a Wurlitzer called the Reed 200. Same system of synthesis, same way the instrument has been created, but this one, no bother at all. <laughs> And is that the service's fault? No, I don't know. I think the plugins vary. Sometimes it's processing power, sometimes it's the way a plugin has been written. Who knows? Perhaps this is going too far in depth. Maybe. <laughs> but I just wanted to give you a flavor of what things are possible. Now, let's get on with some testing. Doorbench then. Doorbench, this classic project from doorbench.com. You can go and download it yourself. You can run exactly the same project on your system and see how you do. The idea is you've got like a, an eight track song of music like that, which is just there to show you at what point the system glitches. What's actually happening is you have 40 sine waves, which you don't hear, over which you insert the same compressor plugin time and time again. 
you keep on adding plugins until the system glitches because it's run out of CPU processing power and that then becomes your benchmark. And you can compare that to other people and other systems and other bits and pieces. It's easy. I've done this same test on all other previous versions of the Surface Pro that I've had and you can look into the performance testing on those if you wish. And it's one of the tests that I will do on the other systems in the Roundup comparison shootout uh, video that I'll be making after I've made this one. So I have the, what's called the Reex Comp Presser. I don't know what it is. Is this compressor here, right? It looks like that. It's one, it's kind of one from the people who made Reaper, but it's quite a meaty one. So it uses up a bit of processing power every time you load one. And you have your project and it's got all of these compressors loaded with the majority of them turned off. And then you go through and turn them on one by one until it crackles. Now, if you were running this on a big desktop machine with the latest i9 processors, for instance, it could do every single plugin. It could run eight plugins on over 40 tracks on each track, making lots of different plugins. With the Service Pro 6, that's not going to happen. With previous versions, I've got up to say 40 plugins, 50 plugins. With this one, I'm up to about 70 and it's still liking it. And that's really quite good. So what, 70 plugins. But I was showing a minute ago that I could just run one instrument and it was crackling. Yeah, yeah, I know. It depends on the instrument. It depends on the plugin. In this instance, I'm running 70 plugins, no glitching. Got the audio performance meter here. And you can see that it's getting up towards the maximum, but it's not there yet. So this is sine wave 30. I've got a row of 40 done plus a 30, that makes 70. So I can enable this one. 71, 72, you can see the CPU meter just going, oh my goodness. 74, 75, still hanging in. Oh no, there you go, so there's glitching. So what you have to do at that point is then just take it back one to make sure you get stable playback. And we can benchmark that at 74. Now, annoyingly, I'm going to do the power thing again, just, just to check, because this is a good place to check, because it's maxed out the processor, it's still running nice. Could we, could we, if we let the turbo speed come back in could we add more plugins and have it reliable let's check now also i should say that different doors handle the turbo mode differently it was really interesting ableton live seemed to work better than cubase in some other testing that i did but it's it's a movable object who knows what could happen this time around so back into the advanced settings processor power management back up to 100 percent Up to 100%. Apply. Now, I know I should probably restart, just be absolutely sure, but it seems to work if you just apply it. So that's what I'm going for. We can also run our little meter thing here, just alongside. I mean, it's using up a few cycles of processing power, but not too much. And it gives us an idea of what's going on. So let's set it back running again. Now you can see immediately that the audio performance in Cubase looks much better. It looks like I've got a whole load more room. Yeah, see, it's up there at 2.3, 2.4. Yeah, nice. Oh, look at how it moves about. <laughs> so let's put a few more plugins in. Okay, so it's glitched already. I only put about two more in. Oh, and it's glitched again. And again, it's because the turbo mode doesn't stick. It doesn't stay up there. It drops back down again. So even though it looks like I've got a lot more headroom, much of fact, I don't. I'm gonna take these out. Back down to 75.
No, back down to 74. And you see now that it's glitching so much because turbo mode is enabled. It's enabled, I've allowed the processor to move about, do its own thing and to work its own magic on running the system. And that's resulted in that I can now run less plugins with turbo mode enabled than I could with it disabled. Does that make sense? <laughs> so if I restrict it, if I take it to 99%, if I restrict the processor, to the 1.6, 1.7 gigahertz, whatever it is it finds itself fixed at, that gives me actually better performance than allowing it to engage with turbo mode and go up to 2.4. Now, this may be different in your experience. You may find that works differently. It may be that your environment is cooler or something else is going on or the piece of software you've got particularly engages with turbo mode really, really well, or there's something really stable going on or it just seems to work. I've certainly sat here uh, and worked with projects with turbo mode on that have been completely fine. Then come back another day and I can't get it to work anymore. <laughs> so it just sort of depends on the day. So my advice over that 99 to 100% switch is just to try it, but I tend to lean to the conservative side of it to stay with 1.6, 1.7 because I know it's always going to work and I know there's not going to be any surprises. Now, of course, it's desperately frustrating that that extra you know, 0.8 gigahertz of power is being completely wasted. But unfortunately, that's the nature of the processor within this system. If there was a way, if there was a way that you could tune the processor to stick at 2 gigahertz, 2.2 gigahertz, you know, so that it doesn't overheat, so it doesn't melt out of its thermal profile. But if you could just tune it to give it a bit more without it dropping and glitching all the time, that would be awesome. But as far as I'm aware, there is no way to do that. Many, many people have tried. I've seen all sorts of ways of people saying they reckon they can do it, and it's never worked. So if you know of a way, by all means tell me, and I'll scoff and laugh at you but you know if it's new and interesting I might give it a try but my understanding is that there is no way to do that because of the thermal profile of the Surface Pro 6 it has to stay within its limits because it has no fan in it and its cooling situation is based upon the fact that turbo mode is temporary it's temporary and then it comes back down it's temporary it comes back down so try it out for yourself and see I think I'll probably ignore that now for the rest of this video because it's very time consuming. So from now on, I'm just going to use the non-turbo mode. Yeah, got it? Good. Right, the next test is the Halley and Polyphony test. I've been doing this one for many, many years as well. And on the big desktop systems, you can run 64 instances of Halley and, and all the Polyphony you could possibly dream of. On the Surface Pro 6, this has actually been working really well. I'm really very pleased with the performance in the testing I've done so far. Now we all know that Halion isn't a particularly intensive plugin. It's not like running 64 serums. No, no, it's not like that. But it's a good standard workstation synth and it's got a, a big range of sounds and I've used all sorts of different sounds within here just to mess it about a bit. So you're not just listening to the one thing, try to make it useful, you know, held notes, polyphony, voices held, some Voices are more complicated and complex than others. Some are simple, some sustain, some do not. It's a mixture, it's a mixed bag, but it gives us again some idea of what the Surface Pro 6 can do. So this is very simple. I've got MIDI tracks associated with Hallions down the side here, lots and lots and lots of Hallions. And I enable them and disable them until it crackles. Same kind of deal really. And then my MIDI project here is just a bunch of notes that get held for a certain amount of time and we see whether it crackles. Let's give that a go. See the climbing audio performance? It's hanging in there. This is with currently 45 instances of Halion loaded. And just to be absolutely clear, I'm using Halion Sonic, I believe it's called, the SE version, the version that comes with Cubase 10. It's 
it's it's all kind of sample based instruments but it's it gives various voices per instrument some of them just give one voice per note some give more than that some have 32 voices just for eight notes held lots of different stuff lots of different instruments and i have a a new instant for each track i'm not loading up 16 within the one instrument it's a new loaded version of Halley and sonic within each so then we add another synth and see how that goes Seems all right. Let's add all the way up to 50, just to see whether I can get it to fall over. Yeah, see, that's a step too far. Let's come back to, to 48, set that going again. Yeah, so that's 48 instances of Hallion. That's awesome. You know, that's going to be, I don't know, 600 note polyphony. Fantastic. That's great. I mean, as I say, Hallion's not a big, major, chunky synth, but it shows you that you could easily run or write a piece of music with 45 instances of Hallion loaded, with 45 different instruments, keyboards, strings, all of them holding eight notes, basses, guitars, organs, whatever you like. It's a complete the possible studio recording music making situation. Now, later on in this video, I will be doing a project in Ableton Live using, you know, larger, bigger, chunkier synthesizers from, you know, Arturia and Native Instruments and other bits and pieces. And that'll potentially give you perhaps a more up-to-date and real-world vibe for what the system can do. But this polyphony test, I find extremely useful. Okay, this is a test with Studio One version 4. I know that 4.5 has just arrived, but I'm doing this now and I don't have time to go back and check that out. So this is currently version 4, but this is a project of 16 tracks of audio, which I have here. It's all purely audio, no MIDI or virtual instruments involved. And for each channel, each track, I have inserted a whole load of stuff. So on each channel, I have the Pro EQ, then Mix Tool, then three compressors, because of course, and a bioral pan, another Pro EQ, another bioral pan for some reason, a limiter, and then a reactor effects. So that's a lot of stuff. It's not, again, the biggest, chunkiest stuff in the world. Most of those, except for the reactor one, is all internal Studio One stuff, but good high quality Studio One stuff. The idea of this test it's purely to show you that I've got 16 channels of audio, which is you know, a fair size for recording a band or doing you know, a reasonable size audio project. And on them, I have uh, 10, 11, 12 plugins per track running, you know, mixing production plugins, proper plugins. And at the end, I've even got a multi-dynamics and a Pro EQ on the master as well. And through all of this, CPU's running at about 50%. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Now what I could start doing now is loading it up with some more intense plugins, like this really nice RC48 reverb from Native Instruments. So what I'll do is I'll copy that across every track. And see if we get a glitch. We did get a glitch then, but that's because I was inserting it. I mean, there's, you know, the process has got to go, oh, it's a new plugin. And so that can often cause a glitch if you're trying to do this during playback. Now it's starting to glitch as I move the mouse about. So as I try to achieve anything else, it then starts to give me a little bit click. So it's starting to become unworkable. But up to that point, I had added four, eight, uh, 12, 13, quite 
a high processor reverbs, which is nice. So that's almost one on every track, along with the uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and along with the 10 that were already there. So 16, 10, 160 plugins, 170 plugins. That's all right. That's all right, that is, 170 plugins. Yeah. Now do bear in mind that your mileage may vary. Why? Because you might be using different plugins. You might be using a different audio interface. Your audio interface may not have the same level or quality of drivers as somebody else's. Some audio interfaces uh, struggle to get audio in and out, weirdly, and have poor drivers, and that results in higher CPU usage just to get audio in and out. With a good audio interface, this one I found to be excellent, I have to say, it doesn't put anything in the way of a CPU, and so you have the best chance of getting audio in and out at relatively low latency. But it varies from interface to interface. It just does. It's just a fact of life. And it varies from plugin to plugin. So I've run 170 plugins. <laughs> you saw earlier that I only run 40 of that uh, uh, RealX compressor. So it depends on what the plugin is and what it's doing and the intensity of the project. All these things contribute to the performance and how well you can do. But 160 audio plugins using Studio One plugins and a few extras, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So I just want to pause for a moment and come back to the performance of a software synth by itself. Because when I started this video, <laughs> I kind of deliberately demonstrated some crappiness because I just wanted to shake it about a little bit because we need to grasp that the Service Pro 6 is an awesome machine but it has its limitations and those limitations may mean that it's not a good fit for you but with these limitations it's always a how long is this piece of string type question it's always a conundrum and so let's just pause for a moment with reactor blocks reactor blocks is quite intense piece of software that runs modular emulations of modular synthesis. I mean, look at this for a complex patch. There's all sorts of stuff going on, but it's completely fine. It's completely stable. There's no worries, there's no glitching going on. So I could absolutely run a complex patch within reactor blocks and have it perfect. And also it's really good doing the modular stuff, doing the front patching as it is in the new reactor blocks with your pen. And so to finish off this, this deep and long and confusing dive into the Surface Pro 6 and all the things that it can do, I'm just going to throw together a track somehow. I'm not entirely sure exactly how this is going to pan out, but I'm going to throw a load of synths in, try to make a track, you know, a few bars long, that sort of thing, and see what occurs. It's got to be worth a go, isn't it? And for the majority of stuff, I'll try to be using third-party plugins like the Arturia stuff I've got in here and the Native Instruments bits and pieces. Anything else I can find just to throw a track together until it glitches. I mean, my experience of this is usually that I run out of ideas after a few tracks and so just then duplicate the tracks. But that works. It works in a very similar way. So I'll get on with that and I'll probably have to speed it up so that you don't fall asleep while I'm creating, generating, that kind of thing. Right. I'll see you at the other side.
Okay, just to take a little bit of a look then to see what I've done. I have created a 10 track, something along those lines sort of project. I've got drums going, I've got a retro mod fat from Traction, I've got an Arturia CS80 playing some chords, I've got Reactor 6 doing some stuff on Super 8, I've got the Stage 73, I've got a Synth Master 2, I've got a Reactor running some blocks, I've got another retro mod, the lead, I've got a Buchler easel, and I've got a Pigments. I've got a decent reverb running, some delay, and some other bits and pieces and effects going on in a bit of an eight bar loop thing going on. The processor says it's at around 55%. I tend to find that 60 to 70 is where you start to get glitches, depending. I mean, it depends on what I now add. If I add a couple of very simple things, I could probably add more tracks and more tracks. If I start adding some more complex ones, then it's gonna break down much quicker. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drop in a serum, see what that has to say. And I'm only running the demo, so it can only run for another 15 minutes. And then we'll sort of leave it there and see what we think, yeah? So there you go, there's a serum running in there as well. I've got a pigment, so I've got a serum, I've got a buckler, I've got reactive blocks all running together, all being lovely, all sitting around 50, 60% CPU with not a glitch in sight. I think that's pretty cool. So what are we then to make of all this? How should we feel about it? Well, as I've said from the very beginning of all this Surface Lark I've been into, I've been doing it since the Surface Pro 3. You know, this is the Surface Pro 6. It's a bit down the line, but all the time, the Surface Pro range, the concept, the idea, has always impressed me enough. It's impressed me enough in that it's a tiny weenie format. It's not much bigger than an iPad, and yet it can run full-on desktop software, full-on door software, proper VST and virtual instruments. And it does a pretty damn fine job of it within its limitations. Let's not kid ourselves that this is a massive fat laptop, that it's a MacBook Pro, or that it's some kind of desktop computer. It's not, it's a Surface. It's a very portable, Ultrabook style laptop with a creative interface, which I find immensely pleasing. I love having this thing knocking around. I run all my tests on it. I run it into my modular. I run other synths through it. I sequence with it. I record audio with it. I perform with it. I send out loops and stuff and video as well, all at the same time, all in the same performance. It's a fantastic little platform. Yeah, sometimes you can load up a, a big fat piano from Arturia, put in a lot of sustain and reverb, and it will crap out just as you're playing, which is a shame because it has its limitations. Put in a fat pigments patch or a serum patch and it's not really gonna be able to handle it. So you have to make a decision. You have to decide whether what it can do, what I've shown it to do, is enough for you. If you stick in the comments, yeah, yeah, right, but what if I run, wanna run three versions of this? I can't answer that question. I can't, I'd love to, but unless I've actually run that myself, I can't really say. All I can do is offer up a bunch of examples. I can write an 11, 12 track session using all virtual instruments within Ableton Live. I could add probably, I don't know, 40 audio tracks alongside if I wanted with effects because I have that much headroom. Audio tracks are no bother to the surface one way or another really. If you go back to the Studio One project that I was running, 16 tracks of audio, 10 effects on each channel, that's a load of stuff. And that was only again up at sort of 40, 50%. I could run a load of virtual instruments alongside that as well. So there is room for creativity. There is room for music production, provided that you grab hold 
of the fact that it has its limitations and work within them. Freeze your tracks, you know, mix down stuff, bounce stuff, all the usual things that we use to get around a lack of processing power. You can, of course, try running it with turbo mode enabled. Give that a go, it might give you a bit more room. If you get the i7 with the fan, you might be able to keep the temperatures under control. You might be able to get a nice bit of stable CPU. If not, run it at the 1.6 and it's going to stick there and it won't let you down at that sort of level. And of course, you're a little bit narked that you can't use all the processing power, but I'd much rather have a stable fully working system than one that's fluttering around all over the place that could get at high and then drops back down again. It's just the nature of the beast. What's the next one going to be like? Who knows, a Service Pro 7 could be anything. It could have Thunderbolt in the side. I mean, who the heck knows what could happen next? But if you're looking for a decent little portable, funky creative studio, it will run an audio interface on its own power. It will run a MIDI keyboard all powered by the Surface and your dongle and bits and pieces on a passive hub. It's great. Of course, it's only got the one USB input. That's why you use a hub, yeah? So there you go. I mean, I hope that's helpful. <laughs> I'd like to think that, that might be helpful to somebody out there. And if you're interested in how well this compares to previous generations, and I'm gonna do a video roundup of that, giving them a good example. Otherwise you can dig around in the previous performance testing videos that I've done. I want to reinforce again that if you have a Surface and you're having some trouble, then do check out my tweaking guide. Follow that first, because that's gonna sort out the majority of your problems. If you have any doubts about that, read the comments under that video of people saying, oh, that sorted me out. Oh yeah, that's brilliant, that sorted me out. That's what people say all the time, that it sorts them out, because there are a few things you need to do to get the Surface running properly. So yeah, that'll do. Thanks for watching, I hope that's been helpful. I hope that's been a deep enough dig into this little machine. And I'll be doing more videos on the Surface as we go along, running other bits of software, running other performances, recording stuff in. I'm going to be mapping it into my Eurorack over here, mapping it back again, using Bitwig 3, other new bits and pieces, lots of stuff coming all the time. On my channel, you'll find a lot of stuff on synthesizers, a lot of stuff on Eurorack, on building stuff, on running software and music technology. That's what this is all about. Encompassing all music technology, whether that's software or hardware, or nutty bits of synthesis stuff. So please do the usual things like subscribe and like and follow. You'll find me on all sorts of social media. And if you're particularly daring, then come and join me on Patreon. Throw me a few dollars and help me continue to make videos like this. And in the meantime, go and make some tunes. Mm -hmm.